so there's really no evidence that uh you know that um eating animal foods or eating cholesterol drives up um cholesterol in the blood um there's i mean if you fast cholesterol is going to go up uh, there's one study that shows that if you fast i think it was like for seven days in the study the cholesterol went up like 45 percent of what it was like it was it went really high and that's because it's trying to deliver energy and your body's having to shift over to another energy source which is fat and that's what carries the the triglycerides around the, the fatty acids so um your body is increasing the cholesterol so they can deliver energy while you're fasting um but it's it, but your body also makes cholesterol the liver makes a ton of cholesterol um, and so your body needs it, but it's not necessarily that when you eat cholesterol, it drives up your, um, um, your, your cholesterol in your blood. Um, for some people that seems to happen. Um, but I think it may be due more to like people being on like in a low carb state, a ketogenic state that, that drives that up, um, or other things. But so the idea, I feel an evolutionary standpoint and a philosophical standpoint, it doesn't make any sense that a food that we've been eating for literally you know, millions of years, even before modern humans evolved, um, would be the thing that's causing heart disease. Because like I mentioned before, heart disease is this kind of newer thing since the 40s and 50s. Um, and uh, and so, so we're not looking at the right thing. We're looking at what, what changed in the 40s and 50s, what changed for humans, right, then. And it wasn't the consumption of cholesterol or saturated fat or animal foods um, that, that had been going on for a long time. So Philosophically, it doesn't make sense. And then when you just look at the research, especially, I mean, it, all the all the systematic reviews of the randomized controlled trials and, and other types of research, um, you can find some, most of the research that says that cholesterol causes heart disease is associational. So it's epidemiology, which is the lowest form of research for a reason. Um, it's because it can't show causation. It can only show that two things are happening at the same time. So you have high cholesterol and you have heart disease. It does, you can't show that one's causing the other. Um, and so, um, we can also find plenty of associational research that shows that high LDL does not cause heart disease and people with higher LDL have, you know, lower all cause mortality and lower rates of heart disease and lower cancer. So which ones do we believe? And the point is you can't believe either one. You have to test them out. Um, and interestingly, um, this did happen. So when this theory first came out, it was, it was an incorrect theory, but it was very heavily tested. And, and Nina Teichel says that it's probably the, uh, the most tested, uh, nutritional theory in in research just because back in the day they spent so much money doing it whereas today nutritional research costs way too much money um, but when they looked at when they were replacing um, when they replaced saturated fat with unsaturated fat in these people's diets they got more heart disease more yeah. all-cause mortality and this happened in five or six different studies that happened around that time like in the 60s and 70s um, late 60s or the 70s and so um so even when we look at the research there's no evidence there that cholesterol causes heart disease. Um, and the questions I like to ask that really throw a kink into things, and it's not like they're, you know, quoted research or anything, but it's like if cholesterol, LDL cholesterol or total cholesterol, whichever, um, is so such a driving force in atherosclerosis and, and cholesterol is present everywhere in the blood, then why do we only see atherosclerosis in certain places? Like why do yeah. we only, why do we see it so much in the coronary arteries and nowhere else or in bifurcations? And, and, and not in veins at all, you know, and the, the short answer is that there's more pressure in those areas. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that, um, cholesterol is causing the, the issue. Um, it's just, it just doesn't make sense from that, that point of view. It's been a few years since I heard you be the one to say that. And I, it had never occurred to me like that, that is mind blowing. That is completely shifting the paradigm. And it's interesting. You mentioned the LDL going up on low carbohydrate, we have to, you know, nod our hats to Dave Feldman and the work that he's done. I mean, a few years ago, he stepped on stage and predicted that his LDL levels would be vastly different based on fasting. And, and when your body is fasting, the way I understand it, you need to mobilize more fats and more cholesterol from inside the body. So the liver will package them up. Hence, you'll have more, you know, volume inside the LDL, or I'm sorry, inside the, the, the LDL particles, essentially. And yeah. that looks like your cholesterol is always high, but it can fluctuate so quickly depending on what you eat or don't eat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and from day to day, too. So that's the other thing, too, is when we look at testing and we say we, say we test someone's blood and their cholesterol is high, like that's one snapshot in time. Um, you know, and Dave Feldman has showed us that cholesterol changes very rapidly, you know, um, you know, from, from day to day, and he can change it pretty dramatically within three days. Um, and so it's not like this static thing that like, if you test high for cholesterol or low for cholesterol, that it's going to stay that way tomorrow. 
Um, and, and, and like you said, like depending on what we, what we eat and, um, and, and, and various other things, like how much we're fasting or, like, or don't eat, you know, um, then it's going to change pretty rapidly. And so it makes no sense to blame this whole disease, this complex biological disease on this one aspect of the body, this one biomarker. Yeah. Um, it's really, really short-sighted. And unfortunately, I think it's been a huge distraction into what is actually causing heart disease. Um, everybody's so focused on cholesterol and then therefore so focused on diet, um, which is an important part of disease in general, but it's not the only part. And it's what everybody focuses on. Everybody's like, oh, diet and exercise, diet and exercise, which are important things to pay attention to. But there's so much more that's that's been um, untouched and, and isn't talked about. Yeah. So interesting. So if I'm, if I'm in the pharmaceutical companies or I'm in the medical system, why would I want to continue to focus my attention on LDL cholesterol and keep pushing that message forward? Uh, mainly. So mainly because it, it drives sales of pharmaceuticals. Um, you know, so there's this interesting, uh, little story that people don't know is that I think it was 1984. Um, they put together, they had this, you know, meeting, um, on this committee, and they decided that cholesterol was bad. Um, and then they put together this um, national education program for to educate physicians on how cholesterol is bad and how to lower it and things like that. And the pharmaceutical companies jumped on that. Um, and they, they came in and they said, um, okay, well, we got to sponsor these things to, to convince them that to drive down what's the recommended um, levels for cholesterol and LDL. And so, you know, it started out that it started out that um, they were saying, oh, cholesterol, like a total or LDL cholesterol could be 250. That's fine. Um, and then it was like, okay, now 200. Uh, and then they went down to 150 and then 100. And now they say below 100. So basically what that tells me is that we have no idea what it's really supposed to be. Um, and that the the um, the motivation of the pharmaceutical companies is what drove it down to be that low. Because the lower it is, the more people can they, they can then test high for for high cholesterol, and then you can prescribe medications. And it's actually it's actually seen as malpractice or not doing the standard of care if you don't recommend a statin drug to someone who has high cholesterol levels. Um, and and even in some cases, like in my case, I was recommended a statin drug when I was um, oh gosh in my mid twenties. Even though I didn't have high cholesterol wow. or anything, it was wow. just. It was the standard of care for anybody who'd been type one diabetic as long as I had, you know, even though I don't think that cholesterol causes heart disease, my cholesterol was normal according to them. Um, but they still recommend a statin because that's the standard of care. Same with the blood pressure medication. Um, I was recommended that because that's the standard of care. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's just crazy. You did give me a good idea when you're talking about the changing levels. If I just make the net bigger when i go play hockey i'm probably going to score a lot more goals so yeah. eventually if we get up to like a soccer size net i'll be <laughs> superstar i'll finally get to play in the nhl this would be great so i appreciate that's right. that that's <laughs> right yeah that's how it works wow absolutely crazy okay next one that you put on there this is about heart attacks and it says well actual blockages in the arteries do happen many heart attacks occur without a blockage yeah so there's actually a lot of evidence that um that heart attacks like tissue death happens and they go in there and there's, there's no blockage whatsoever. Some people don't even have stenosis. Um, and so everybody thinks that, you know, this, um, you know, this, this artery narrows, this stenosis happens. Uh, we get this buildup of, of people think cholesterol and everything. And, and that slowly narrows the artery um, over time. And then it ends up blocking it and we get a heart attack. However, there are plenty of examples um, and of people who have like a 90% blockage and a run of marathons. Um, so there's, there's no way that they could run um, a marathon with 10% of blood to an area of their heart. Um, and, and so that, you know, begs the question of, you know, when can a heart attack happen without a blockage? Um, and are those, is that stenosis um, really an issue in, in general? So there's this researcher named Giorgio Baraldi who did a lot of work with this. And he, he did these, what called, what he called plastic cast studies where he, you know, you ever been to like the body world exhibits where yeah, they, crazy. You know, they, they, yeah. Where they like, um, they take an organ or even like the animals inside out or whatever, like where they take the whole animal and they, they have this map of the arterial system. They fill it with like this plastic material. That's like a, a liquid and then it hardens and then it dissolve away the rest of the tissue. And you're left with this cast of the arterial system. And, um, and that's what he did with hearts um, for a lot of his career. And he found that, Anywhere that there was a um, more than 70% stenosis of a coronary artery, that the body had fully compensated that area with collateral arteries 
enough to you know, supply the heart with enough blood. So um, that shows us that why that shows us why the, the studies on um, outcomes with um, uh, with like stent placements, like elective stent placements, not emergency ones, but elective stent placements and bypass surgeries don't really lead to better outcomes for people. They don't, they don't help them um, live longer or have less mortality in the long run. And um, that's because the body has already bypassed it itself. It, it's done that pretty quickly because I've got studies that show that the body can do that within four days. Um, that's remarkable. Yeah. So, um, so that's why, um, but then you know, so heart attacks do happen though when a, when a, a clot can form um, and block an artery. So like, say, let's say some of that stenosis breaks off or some atherosclerosis breaks off and um, that inflammation causes the clot to form. And that's kind of an acute heart attack with a blockage. But then the ones without a blockage, um, there's tissue death. And Baraldi found this all the time. He found that, you know, because he, he did autopsies of people with who had heart attacks and ones who didn't. And, um, you know, he found that sometimes the heart attack occurred um, in a totally different area other than where the stenosis was. Um, and there was no, no blood flow restriction there. And so um, it happens because of three different things. One, we have an imbalance in the autonomic nervous system, which is, um, you know, our fight or flight versus rest and digest parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system. Um, and um, high amounts of oxidative stress, which is when um, the body has too many free radicals floating around. Um, which are our molecules with an unpaired electron that really want to be paired. And these are kind of a natural process of physiology. Um, but when they get too many, they can become an issue. And the other one is being, have been poor. So, I'm sorry. That's when they have the, the free radicals have those crazy chain reactions, right? Yeah. Yeah. So like they, they have an unpaired electron and they really, really want to be paired. Um, and so they, they go and they steal the electron from, from anywhere they can. Um, and so, uh, in, in doing that, they also cause damage to a tissue and create another free radical in the process, yeah. which is Got the it. chain I reaction see. that happens. Um, okay, and so, um, so that, and then being metabolically inflexible. So, you know, having, or at least having less ability to burn fatty acids, um, and your body is kind of, um, uh, predominantly burns carbohydrate. Um, so when those three things, when those three imbalances happen, there's a situation where we can get a surge and a stress response to the heart and, that can create a situation where the heart is forced to burn more glucose than it wants to. It's always burning some glucose, but it really prefers fatty acids and ketones and it burns that predominantly. But when we get a surge of adrenaline to the heart and we get a, we don't get the balance, um, uh, non-stress signal to the heart, which is always supposed to be balanced. We're always supposed to get both at the same time. Um, when that doesn't happen because oxidative stress blocks that from happening, um, and we're, we're metabolically inflexible. So our body is used to burning more carbohydrate, then we can get a surge of carbohydrate burning or glucose burning in the heart. And that can create lactic acid, um, that can create hydrogen ions that, that create kind of a muscle burn in the heart, which we know is angina. Um, people call that chest pain angina, but it's the same kind of muscle burn you get if you went for a run and your legs started to burn. Um, but the only thing is, is that when your legs start to burn during that run that you can stop if it gets too bad, but the heart can't stop contracting. And so, um, so yeah, then uh, when that happens, um, it actually creates this swelling because of that lactic acid. And just like in your, in your muscle tissue, it creates a little bit of swelling. And then the blood can't get into the area because the swelling is too much pressure to push it out. And we get this hypoxic stagnant blood sitting in this area of the heart that causes tissue death. Um, and, and that's the heart attack that we see without a blockage. And it's very, very common, way more common than, than we think.